Welcome listeners. I'm really excited about today. I have a special guest, Brittany Squillis, and she is, she's a marriage and family therapist, but she's also a grief therapist. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to kind of cover, after we get to know Brittany a little bit better, we're going to cover three topics. And what it, one is ambiguous loss and how that's relevant to divorce. I don't even know what that is. So Brittany's going to teach me as we go. And then we're going to talk about the next thing we're going to talk about are what are some of the obstacles in recognizing divorce as a loss. And then some common experiences that um, people grieving with divorce face. So, you know, I think it's just, it's a topic that needs to be discussed because there's got to be a grieving process to it. It is a lot. So I think it's awesome that you are a mix of a, a grieving, a grief therapist and a marriage and family therapist. And I welcome you here. I thank you for your time. And I'm really excited to get to know you and to learn. So Brittany, would you please just share your story as to what led you to work in this field? Yeah, thank you. I would be happy to. I'm happy to be here. So thank you for having me speak with you and your listeners. And um, so, yes, I'm Brittany Squillis, a uh, licensed marriage and family therapist. And really a, a big question I'll get is, so can you see individuals too? And actually the majority of the work I do is with individuals. Um, a lot of our licensure really just means that we work from a systemic approach more than, mo more than other licensures do. So basically what that means is we look at the whole system, all the systems that are influencing us. So even if we're working with an individual, we'll look at their environment, we'll look at their family, we'll look at their social network, because um, those are all the things that influence and impact the things that we're facing and battling. So we take everything into play as opposed to just look at the one person. Um, so that's kind of where our licensure comes from. And then, yeah, of course, it probably makes us look a little bit more qualified to sit with a, right. a couple or a family, but people who don't have that licensure can also sit with couples and families as well. Well, and I was going to just add that I have heard that even if you're, if you're going to a therapist and you're not going together, but each party is getting therapy, sometimes they say that helps even more than sitting through it together. Because as you grow it's funny how sometimes it can rub off on the other person. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And usually what will happen, not all the time, but it's not uncommon for one of two things to happen. I'll have a couple come in right away. We'll do some work with them. And then we'll hit a point where the individual parts of each partner are starting to come into the session mm -hmm. and it makes it hard to work together as a couple. So then I'll have them go out, do their individual stuff, and then come back or do individual work in conjunction with couples mm -hmm. therapy. Or I'll start working with an individual on marriage stuff. And then it, we get to a point of like, hey, let's bring your partner in and see what how we can expand on that. Um, so there, yeah, there is a lot of things that we can do with an individual that they can bring into their partnership, marriage, whatever it is, um, that we don't necessarily need the part other partner around for, but it's always right. good to have that them there if needed. So right. yes, it is possible to do that work without both present. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, now I want to know a little bit more about the grief therapy. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. So typically grief is attached to a common loss, which is the death of a loved one, but it can also surface and well, not also, it does all the time surface with these non-death losses, which mm -hmm. we call ambiguous loss. That's so ambiguous amb loss, yep. non-death. Yep. Got it. Got it. <laughs> yep. so ambiguous losses are any losses that are kind of vague and unclear. Like it's really hard to pinpoint what the loss is. Right. So let's take divorce, for example. It's like, okay, well, what am I, what am I really losing? And it can look mm -hmm. different for everybody. It can be the loss of the marriage, right? For some individuals, and I'll get a little bit into this um, later on with some of the topics we cover, but with some individuals, it's not so much the marriage that they're grieving, but maybe what they had or what they could have had. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are ambiguous losses. So I kind of <clears throat> found my way into grief through a couple of different paths, but the, a few of the main ones being my paternal grandparents passed within a month of each other back in 2012. Ugh. So obviously 
had my own grief stuff, but I really struggled in watching my dad grieve and struggled in the sense of I could see he wasn't getting what he needed, but I didn't know what he needed. So mm -hmm. I sat with him and let him grieve, which now being in the profession that I'm in, I know that's probably one of the best things you can do for someone who is grieving is just to hold a safe space for them to do Love that. that. Lesson number one, that's yeah. going to make me better. <laughs> yes. Okay. And, that, and that's, and that's to be true, regardless of whatever, whether it's ambiguous loss or loss around the death of a loved one, if you can hold a safe space for them to grieve in whatever way that looks, you are doing way more than you think you are. Um, cause society is, it's very much like, we don't talk about, we don't talk about grief. We don't talk about loss. Like it's really uncomfortable. So if you can hold that space, you're doing amazing things for the individual who's grieving. So I wanted to create a space for not only those who are grieving to do that in a healthy and safe fashion, but also to educate those who are helping someone grieve mm -hmm. how to do that in an effective way. So good. And okay. And so then I can't help but wonder, like you talk about, at helping a person who's going through the grieving process by sitting with them and giving them a safe space. And then I can't help but think when you're grieving, allowing yourself that safe, is that true? Yes. That yep. safe place to just feel. You got how it. Awful it feels. Yes. Yeah. And it's uncomfortable in both situations, yes. right? I mean, I've sat with a lot of clients, whether they're grieving the loss of a loved one, a divorce, um, whatever else it might be, a job, right? Whatever it is, they talk about this sensing the discomfort from other people. So then they mm -hmm. mute their own grief to make them comfortable, yeah. right? So yes, support, try to create that space. But then also I talk to a lot of clients about this idea of sitting with grief. Mm -hmm. And really all that is, is allowing exactly what you're saying of allowing yourself to sit in a space when grief comes up, obviously do it effectively, right? And if you're not sure how to do that, that's where a therapist can come into play to make sure you are creating a safe space because we don't want that to spiral you. But there can be some benefit in sitting with the discomfort that comes with grief, right? The sadness, the anger, mm -hmm. the confusion, whatever it might be. There can be a lot of benefit in holding your own space and saying, I'm okay. This is uncomfortable, but I'm okay. And I can sit here and feel these because it's this is real. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Now I just have so many questions. Okay. How do you tell me about you? You talked about making sure it's a safe space. What wouldn't be a safe space? Mm. That is such a good question. So when I talk to, I'll speak to a safe space with other people and then I'll speak to a safe space with yourself. Okay. Um, so when I talk to those who are grieving or really people who are supporting someone, we talk about this idea of safe support. And so what I mean by a safe support system is essentially you, these are people that you can go to that, you know, will hold your stuff, not take it on as their own, but mm -hmm. hold it and say, this is okay. They're not going to make you feel bad about it. They're not going to try to dismiss. They're not yeah. going to try to downplay what you're experiencing. They're not going to do these well-intentioned comments, but come off as very dismissive to those who are grieving of, well, everything happens for a reason you know, you were best to get out of that marriage anyway. They missed out, right? Those are well-intentioned, but for those who are grieving, that's not supportive. It feels very dismissive. So these safe, for someone, when you're going to someone for support, holding a safe space looks like that. Of They're not going to dismiss you. They're not going to judge you. They're going to hold your stuff in a way that feels caring. Um, and they're just going to allow you to, to be. Can I ask a question? Because this is going to help me. I know nothing about this. Yeah. Um, and I need to know about it. So, so I'll just, I'm going to be open here. So my son-in-law lost his mom to okay. breast cancer before my daughter, right before my daughter met him. And he still <laughs> grieves. Oh, sure. It. And I, I always said, I wish I would have, I, why didn't I call you to figure out how to deal with this? But I know that the last time I never know what to say. So I just sit there. Yeah, just sit there because I can't, I can't understand my mom's still alive. I can't understand what he's feeling. Yeah. Um, but I have the last time I was with him, I said, then we weren't, it wasn't when he was sitting in a state of grief. We, I, we were talking about his mom and I said, wow, she was a really strong person, woman, wasn't she? And my daughter's in her residency in med school. So he's wearing the hat of 
parenting their two-year-old. He's mm -hmm. running the household. He's very supportive. And um, I said, wow, what a blessing that you had the mom that you did because look at, you know, this has made you better able to help Abby through this. So then I'm just, but I just always feel like, am I saying the wrong thing? Am I making this worse? How do I deal with this? And it's all these years later. Yeah. And I think those are all great questions. And I think because you are already in a mindset of wondering, like, is this helpful? You're yeah. already being a little bit more careful than individuals who don't have that thought process. Right. So even though you may not know exactly what to say or if you're saying the correct things, the fact that you're even questioning, is this right? You're probably creating a safer space than you think. Okay. Um, and I have a blog article and I can send this to you so you can share it to your listeners as well. Yes. But I have a couple of blog articles that give some tips on how to support someone who is grieving. And these are applicable to anyone, whether it's a, a non-death loss or the uh, the death of a loved one. Um, but so different skills, different tools. Um, but one of the biggest things I talk about is if you don't know, ask, mm -hmm. right? Be always yeah. be curious, right? So if you can say something and I, I hesitate because <laughs> I'll also sit with people on the other end and they're like, they ask me like, what do you need? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I, but I can be frustrating too. Cause sometimes those who are grieving yeah. truly don't know what they need, but I have another blog article that helps address that. So I've got a tool for that. But if they, you know, you're giving an example of your, your son-in-law and he's doing all these different things and, you know, okay. So let's say you made a comment of, wow, you know, what a blessing it was to have the mother that you had, because look at what she instilled in you, all this stuff. And if you notice a different reaction, right, either discomfort or mm -hmm. that brings emotion to them or whatever it might be, I think it's OK for you to say, did I say something wrong or what, was that not the right thing to say? Right. Because you're also learning. Right? right. He's learning his grief journey, even though it's years later. But you're also learning as someone who's supporting a loved one, especially if you haven't walked with this before. When my mm -hmm. husband lost his grandfather and we were dating at the time, I had told him, I said, let me know what you need. I said, this is the first time we've ever navigated something like this. And I don't know how you, how you do this type of work. Right? right. So let me know what you need. I gave him space and we figured it out. Right. So similar to that, if you're still kind of learning how he grieves, so I think it's okay to remain curious and ask in a gentle way of, was that okay to say? Or should I have said something different? And they may not have an answer right away, but that at least sets the platform for them to come back and say, hey, on second thought, could you say it this way differently? Or that was perfect. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, Brittany, because we humans are so interesting. It's yes, just, we are. <laughs> just easy. Just like ask. If you're feeling, you know, why wouldn't I have just been honest and said, is that hurting you? Because I don't want to hurt. You know what I mean? Like, so because we don't want to hurt them. Yeah. Right. And, that, and that's um, that can be one of the obstacles to any sort of grief, but also for individuals who are walking a divorce of their support system may not want to ask because they're like, I don't want to trigger anything for them. Yeah. And I will say more often than not, there is nothing you will ask them that they haven't already been thinking about. Right. Okay. So now I want to move into, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm getting a, a free therapy session and I so appreciate that. I love what I learned. Now let's talk about those non-death and how, yeah. do, what, what is the, what is the thing about divorce and, and what makes it different? Yeah, that's a great question. So really the only difference is, is that your loss did not occur through death. That's it. That really, I mean, every grief journey is different because every person is different, right? And every loss that we experience is different in terms of the type mm -hmm. of loss, who that person was to us, the role they played, how the loss occurred, right? All of that can influence how we grieve. But really the main difference and really only difference is, well, I guess two, right? You're, you're your own person. So your grief is going to look different. And the loss you're grieving didn't occur through death and the person is still living, Right. And some may say divorce is death of a marriage. Yes. Right. But there isn't a human. There isn't a person that that has stopped living because of this loss. Right. Or, you know, the loss didn't stem from that. So really, that's the main difference when we're talking about ambiguous losses. 
Well, and I've heard it said sometimes that the grief with divorce is almost more difficult because that person made the choice. And I don't know, it's probably not easy to measure. Yeah. And that, right. We talk about that too, of like, no loss is better or worse, you know, easier or harder. They're just right. Right. Um, but yeah, that is one thing that I, I, that we can talk about here a little bit, um, in one of the topics that we're talking about, but that can be one of the tricky things of yes, this loss is hard because they chose it. Yeah. Right. But also the loss can be tricky because it's like, how do I fully grieve and move on? And I put that in quotes because sometimes mm-hmm. move on can feel like forget it. It's in the past. It's not part of your story anymore, which yes and no. Right. It is in the past. And also it will always be part of your story. Mm-hmm. You get to choose, however, how that impacts your story moving forward. That's where the power lies in that moving on area. So, but some people will find it's hard for me to move on when I'm consistently running into this person, whether they're Mm co-parenting or if it's a divorce that drags on, right? They're like, how do I fully grieve and move on if I have to continue to interact with this person? How do they? So it's a lot of skills around how do you kind of separate the two Um, And choose how that person is going to continue to be in your life. So similar to the death of a loved one, we talk about like these continued bonds, right? And even though they're not physically here with us, how do they still show up in your world? Mm -hmm. How do they still, you know, take part in what's happening? So this is kind of reverse if you don't want that person physically in your life anymore, right? So it's more how can I choose Mm-hmm. to continue a life without being fully connected to them, right? Whether that's just because it's not an option or they weren't healthy to have in our life, right? And then the ways in which they are connected, how do I choose to interact with that, right? And not attach it to my being, to my decision-making, all of that, right? They're just so it sounds like it's it's going to take some work. Oh, it's yeah. Take yeah, some it's going to take a lot of work. <laughs> it's going to take work and it's going to be okay. It's going to take work and it's going to be okay. And there are going to be moments where it's going to feel like this is impossible. I'm never going to get there. And I promise you, you will. Well, and what I find is divorce is so hard. And I like to try to make this an opportunity for people because I don't want them back divorcing again. Yeah. That's one thing. But an opportunity for growth. And it's been pretty rare that I have found someone that looks back, you know, 10 years later and says, Oh, I'm sorry. I did that. Everyone's like, Oh, I'm so thankful that I did it when I, when I did. And so to just know that you will get there. Yeah. You know, there is the, the other side, um, might need a little help from a Brittany. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And knowing too, that even when you get there, whatever there is, When we talk about grief, we don't, I usually like to stay away from closure or this idea of kind of finalizing a goal because grief is, grief will never go away. So when I talk about that with clients, they kind of go, oh my God, like you mean to tell me I'm going to feel this way forever? And I say yes and no. Right. Yes, in the sense that when we're talking about the death of a loved one, yes, in the sense of that you will always love your person and that person is always going to come up in your life some way, whether it's a reminder or a, a sign, if that's if that's kind of how you resonate with things. Um, so therefore, the grief is going to kind of always show up. What changes and what will not feel like this forever is the intensity and the frequency in which it shows up. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about divorce, it's very similar to that of this will always be part of your story. So there may be times where it hits you like a ton of bricks and you're like, where in the world did that come from? Like, I was doing totally fine. And here I am now reminiscing about this marriage that we divorced 10 years ago. Right. It happens. It's okay. What will change and what won't feel the same over time is the intensity in which that happens and how often that happens. So the hope lies in that piece of it will change over time. Yeah, it is a really, really hard concept to understand. It really is. 
And I, you know, I have been through it with my grandparents and mm -hmm. um, with animals and an uncle, oh, yeah. in-laws. Um, and I don't know, I've, I, you know, I haven't been divorced, so that hasn't been one of my losses. Yeah. Um, but I've had loss and it's and like, you know, I just think of my husband not having his parents and it's the holidays and it is, it, it just sneaks up. It mm -hmm. just it does. And, and yet you learn to carry it and you still have a beautiful life. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely. hard to imagine that you're going to be able to feel, have grief. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really hard. I bet to give people hope. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, we talk about that of like how, and some of this stuff too, I am very careful when I bring it into the work with my clients, this piece that you're talking about of there is hope and there can be, it is possible for grief and having a life outside of the loss to coexist. Right. And you know, some of that people would describe of like, there are some really beautiful things that can come out of a loss and grieving. But if you tell someone that too quickly in their grief journey, yes. that's going to be very off putting. They're like, yeah. excuse me, you yes. mean to tell me that losing my loved one or going through a divorce of a marriage that I absolutely cherished is a beautiful thing. Screw you. <laughs> I'm gone. Right. <laughs> right. So we have to be careful with that, but it is absolutely possible. And I'll, I'll give an example from my own experience. So I myself have not been divorced, but I come from a divorced family. Uh, my parents divorced back when I was, oh my gosh, I think it started when I was eight and it was finalized by the time I was 11, maybe. Um, you know, so growing up that didn't think anything of it. I do remember having a specific thought of before they have sat, sat us down to tell us that they were divorcing, like a couple days before that, I was just looking at my family and I was like, oh, this is my family. Nobody's going to take that away from me. Uh -huh. And then two days later, a couple days later, they shared with us that they were divorcing. So, but now looking back at it, this piece of, you know, it will be okay. You will grow. It will reduce over time. And also it will still come back up because I'm 31, almost 32 now. And the holidays usually are the ones that I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go, right? Yeah. We got to figure out how do we get to moms and how do we get to dads, right? Do we want to spend time with our step families? Do we, right? So it kind of always comes up and usually it manifests for me of, I just wish I had one family unit on yeah. my side to visit and then go see my husband's and not have yeah. to take into account my mom and her remarriage, my dad and his remarriage, right? So that's it's usually- not it is a lot. So that's usually where some of the grief will come up for me. And it's not as intense, nearly as intense as it used to be, but it is kind of a moment of like, oh, yeah, it was a loss. This, it was a this loss. Really sucks. Yeah. So even that right. 20 plus years later, and I still have moments where I'm like, dang it. If, right. if only this could be different. Right. Okay. So now I want to, because I want to get better at this Yeah. and I want to help people through this grief. What's a way, because I, they're coming to me really early on, okay. that I can give them hope in a really sucky time. Yeah. And I mean, that's tricky because it, it, how I usually do that with clients is I will, I don't want to say like share research, <laughs> right? But mm -hmm. Share education on the typical, what you can expect from grief, right? So talking about this piece of here's how it changes. When we say grief changes over time, here's what that means, right? It means that the intensity and the frequency will reduce, but you will still always love your person. So they will always be there, right? So trying to doing some sort of education like that and, or I tell them, I will hold the hope for you, right? There are oh, I like that. Yep. There are different things that we can do that I am confident that will help you get to the spot that you want to be. It won't be easy and it's not going to be linear. And there are going to be days where you're like, what the hell are we doing here? Right? right? <laughs> I'm not moving or it feels like I went all the way back to square one. That's okay. Yeah. That's going to happen. That's part of growth. Right. Um, but I will tell clients of, you know, I'll, I will hold the hope for you. I love that. And I'm looking at the time and I can't even believe it. And I feel like that's such a powerful message for my, my listeners 
you know, let someone hold the hope for you. Yeah. If you're going through this right now and it's hard and, and, you know, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah. Well, and I was going to say with that of let someone hold the hope for you, but also this is part of having a support system too, of if you have a good day or you have a moment, like a good moment in your day, highlight that, right? I'll talk to clients about, whoa, 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 hold on. A couple weeks ago, this felt really hard for you. And now you're coming in here and telling me that it was actually okay that you managed it. Let's celebrate that, right? That's that part of hope, right? Of yeah. So now you can start holding that hope for yourself because you're like, oh, I did it once before. This yeah. was an example where things were starting to shift for me. So maybe it's going to be okay. I love that. And I just did a podcast about looking back and seeing the gains that you've yes. made. So I have stopped looking at what I've done wrong in a day. Mm -hmm. And so there's one little thing that you can go, yeah. how have I made a gain? I think that's amazing. So anyway, we're getting towards the end and we have like the ending segment where I get like a key takeaway. You've given yeah. us a lot, but if you have something that the audience can do right now to help them, um, can you share that with us? Yes, absolutely. So one of the one main things I wanted to make sure I touch on is ambiguous loss or divorce or anything that fits within this category falls into a type of grief called disenfranchised grief, which basically means it's a loss and a grief that doesn't get recognized. So then therefore we don't grieve it the way that we should. So one of the biggest ways we can start challenging that is acknowledging that this is a loss ourselves, right? So be able to tell yourself, this is a loss and I deserve to grieve it. So I would say start there one, and then I will send you, Lisa, an exercise to help your listeners to start figuring out, okay, what have I lost? So it'll ask them to explore what have I lost, right? What's already gone? So that's the past. What yeah. am I currently losing? That's the present. And what do I fear losing? Yeah. So moving forward, what do I fear losing? That is going to help you, one, to figure out where do I maybe need to do some work, but also it's that's going to really solidify that, yeah, this is a loss and I'm validating that. And by me exploring these questions is removing my grief and loss from that disenfranchised grief, right? Because you deserve yeah. to get that acknowledged and grieve that. So recognize it yourself. Channel, challenge that disenfranchised grief and then explore those three questions that Lisa all sent to you. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have that in the show notes. And thank yeah. you. That That's amazing. And that just, that helps me be a better mediator because I can also validate. Yes. That they are feeling, yeah. you know, that's what, yep. that's a, something that I can do. So I appreciate you so much. Now just tell me how my listeners, we're going to have it in the show notes. Yeah. If they want some grief therapy, if they want some marriage and family therapy? How can they yes. get a hold of you? Yes. Great question. So email is usually the, the easiest way. So it's just my first initial B as in boy and then squillis, S-Q-U-I-L-L-A-C-E at bestselftherapy.net. So Wonderful. email is going to be the best way. Otherwise you can check out my website, Best Self Therapy. There's a, you can schedule a free consultation on there. Um, and even if you're not divorced, if you're in the beginning, it doesn't matter where you are. Yeah. If you're contemplating it, if you're in the beginning, if you're in the end, if you've been divorced for 10 years, it does not matter. Right. Grief does not discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> so wherever you are, if you feel like you're navigating a loss and you don't know where to start, I would be happy to sit down with you and figure out what our time working together might look like. So. Yeah. Well, I think it would be a very positive interaction. And like I said, your information will be in the show notes. So Great. listeners go to Brit Brittany if you are needing some help. And Brittany, again, thank you. I have learned so much. I so appreciate you coming on and taking the time. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes. Take good care. Thank you, you too.